Oh, amen. I'm telling you now, we're blessed. Say amen. amen. Next Sunday is Mom's Day, and uh, we'll, um, under the direction of our uh, children's pastor, we'll be uh, helping some moms and dads uh, celebrate by biblical uh, commitment to raise uh, their children, over 20 children uh, uh, that will be uh, spread out across this altar. And uh, so we are very blessed. What a beautiful group of young. I'm telling you all, it occurred to me, you know, I tell you all the time, uh, we're very blessed. We've not had an ugly baby in this congregation in years. <laughs> and I was looking at all them young people, and I couldn't find but two ugly ones in there. <laughs> and they were both boys, and they know who they are. So, amen, amen. Take your copy of God's Word. Go to the book of Joshua. Uh, you are uh, going to the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua is a, uh, not only an incredible historical record, of the journey of faith that the children of Israel made. It's also a, a picture, a typology, uh, uh, an analogy of the spirit-filled life. We are closing out today a series called Faithful, and I wanted to hone in a little bit uh, specifically for the students, for those who are graduating, and uh, the book of Joshua uh, carries some of the most powerful principles when it comes to some of the things that you are facing. We are going to focus our attention for just a moment on the first three verses of the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it is our custom to rise out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. If you could join me, no condemnation if you can't, uh, Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead now. Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said unto Moses. Father, we thank you for what we've already experienced. We thank you for your presence, for the promise of what the gospel means. And we pray that no spirit that's not in agreement with the Holy Spirit would have any authority in this room. Let every problem that we face, let every anxiety that we confront simply melt in the audience of who you are. For it's in the name of Jesus we ask. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As you take your seat, um, in preparation uh, for this particular message, uh, it occurred to me, uh, just out of curiosity, what does, it, what does it mean to graduate? Where did that come from? Where, where does this tradition, you know, sometimes uh, we get wrapped up in traditions and we just do them because we've always done them. So I did what is called a, a, an etymological research on the word graduate. Come to find out in about the 12th, mid-12th century in Europe, they began to build what were called universities. Universities existed, these particular schools existed for a multifaceted perspective on life. And uh, the degrees that are given are given in relation to the accomplishments, obviously, of the students. The word graduate uh, comes from the Latin word graduus, which means to step into. It means to walk from one particular place, not just physically, but to step into a place uh, quite literally as your life changes. I don't have to tell the graduates, specifically those who are um, in high school, that you are quite literally about to enter into a whole nother season, another chapter, another dimension. So with that uh, in mind, I want to just give you two or three practical principles out of this book of Joshua that I pray will uh, encourage you and equip you, enlighten you as you step into this new place in life. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're not a graduate, you, you can check out. There's principles here for all of us. Say amen. Now, if you're taking notes, um, I want you to write something down. And guess what? If you're not taking notes, I want you to write it down. So here's the very first step. We've got three steps with a few uh, side shuffles. How's that? We've got three steps with a few just sub-steps. Uh, first, I want us to look at um, the, the first step, which is a new beginning, not an ending. Now, I want you to go back to the text, if you would, and listen one more time, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, on the surface, if you just take it uh, 
purely in its theological setting, a devotional moment, you, you're, you're, you're going to miss a little bit of something. You've got to step into this text. You've got to feel what's going on. And you can't just simply look at Joshua as some cold, antiquated historical figure. This is a man who lived and breathed and struggled with the same uh, struggles and anxieties and, and situations that you and I do. So for just a moment, when I tell you that this is a new beginning, not an ending, let me explain what I mean by this particular first point. What I mean by this is simply to say that uh, we are not indifferent. We are not oblivious to those of you specifically, again, that are moving uh, in, out of high school or perhaps out of those first years of college into a whole new world. Joshua's world has been turned upside down. Um, you have spent uh, at least, depending on where you are in life, you have spent the last 18 to 20 years in a very rhythmic routine. You have, in all probability, uh, kind of flowed with a rhythm over the last several years. Up and out the door to school and the activities and the extracurricular events, things that have just become f part of your life, but those are shifting now. Now, you're no longer necessarily known as a student. Your identity is about to change. I want you to listen carefully what I'm about to say to you. When I say that this is a new beginning, not an ending for Joshua, well, I want you to imagine for just a moment what he must be going through. For the last 38 to 39 years, his identity has been tethered to Moses. I really do not have the ability. I cannot articulate. I don't possess the vocabulary to elevate to you how important Moses was. He was the Abraham Lincoln of the Jewish life. He was the emancipator, the liberator. He was the one that did the impossible. You had a, uh, somewhere between six and seven million uh, children of Abraham, Hebrews who were subjugated, enslaved in a place called Egypt, which is a picture of the world. The whip had laid their back open. They were supposed to be living in the promise and the presence and the power of the land. But for the last 480 years, they'd been living under the tyranny of an egomaniac who thought himself to be God by the name of Pharaoh. By the miraculous strong hand of the Lord, almost 40 years prior to this text, Moses shows up out of nowhere. He'd been on the run from God and he uh, showed up out of nowhere and quite literally he turned the world upside down. Plagues started breaking out and Pharaoh uh, lost his firstborn son and God made a highway in the Red Sea and they left out of there with their pockets filled with back pay with the promise of going to houses they didn't build, to wells they didn't dig, to milk cows they didn't buy, to eat banana pudding they didn't make. <laughs> Say amen. For 40 years, Essentially, his identity had been in Moses. For 40 years, um, he had walked up the mountain to let Moses go on up to receive the Ten Commandments. When Moses would go into the tabernacle to get a word from God, he lingered outside as a faithful servant. For 40 years, he waited faithfully as, a, as an associate pastor to this mighty man of God by the name of Moses. And now Moses is dead. But that's not all. It's not just that Moses has passed from the scene. It's that they're standing on the banks of the promised land. They're on the brink of going in to possess. For 39 years, they've been in a walking funeral procession. They started out in faith and they came out in power, but they rebelled against God and stiffened their neck and hardened their hearts. And for the last 39 years, my theology professor at Liberty Baptist uh, School of Divinity said that uh, just doing the simple math, that six days a week for the last 39 and a half years, they stopped 82 times a day to bury some doubting, divisive person who couldn't go into the promised land. It's amazing to me that if you were to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, the text says that when they got to Horeb, the mountain Horeb, to bivouac and to get ready to go into the promised land, it was an 11-day journey. 11 days they were away from liberty and living in the presence of the Lord and the passion and the possession and the power of all that he had. In 11 days, they were going to step across the Jordan and finally realized the promise of the seed of Abraham. And then the Bible says from verse 1, it was an 11-day journey. And verse 2 says, and 40 years later, if you have any doubt they were Baptists, just put it right there. <laughs> Voted on it. 
And for 39 and a half years, they lingered in the doubt and dry desert of death, funeral after funeral after funeral, and agonizing because they simply refused to believe God. And now, Joshua standing on the, the banks of the Jordan, casting a wishful eye, gets word that uh, his pastor, the people's pastor, Moses, is dead. Now, don't, don't, don't pass by this. I want you to think about something for a moment. Who's going to take them in? We, we've come so far. Now, I'm going to say something to you quite candidly this morning. It's completely out of my personality. If you're visiting today, I'm usually, in fact, I'll just tell you, if you don't know me, I'm the Joel Osteen of Knoxville, but I'm going to step out of that for just a moment. I don't want you to just look at Joshua and the situation he's got. I, I, want, I, want, you to, I want you to, for a moment, I want you to think about what he's going through. Everything has changed. I want you to imagine those of us that have been fortunate enough to have grown up in this nation in a far different day. When Chris and I started out believing that love could pay the bills until we got the first electric bill. <laughs> but we had hope. And you could move into the American dream and you, you could make, I looked it up, 1993 when Christy and I got married, you could, you could make if you made $35,000 a year, you could get a mortgage and buy a home for $125,000 to $150,000. A graduate that you saw today, if it, they would have to make the equivalent of $140,000 to buy the median home, which is over $300,000 today. And oftentimes we look at them with their youth and their energy and the, all the power and the prospects and we completely miss what's going on in their life, just like Joshua. Joshua's wondering, what, wh where's the dream? Who's going to lead us in? I want to pause and I want to say something to every graduate in this room. I understand the cultural context we're living in. I understand that dozens upon dozens upon dozens of our campuses that are supposed to be educating our sons and daughters are now indoctrinating them and they're standing and they have no clue what they're begging for when they say from the river to the sea. They have no clue that they're calling from the ethnic cleansing of a whole people called the Hebrews. They couldn't find Gaza on a map if you put a red pen in it. They have no clue that what they're calling for is, is not the liberation of a Palestinian people. They're calling for a Marxism that embraces the passing around. I got tickled when Pastor C said she's looking for somebody to pay her college loans. Just hold on, Joe will do it. I am not looking to make friends in this room. Everything that we stood for, everything we believed in is shifting. That's not political, it's cultural. And now they're looking in their, in their early years and in their, uh, in their 20s and dreaming of getting married and having a family. And much like Joshua, they're sitting on the banks of reality with tears streaming down their face and they think, this is the end. How, Moses is dead. Who's going to lead us into the promised land? Listen to me. God's still in heaven. He's still on the throne. You may not realize the American dream, but I promise you something that is far greater than the American dream that money can't buy and the devil can't steal. I promise you on the authority of this inspired, infallible book that there is a, pr a plan and a purpose for your life. It may not be to realize the American dream and you may not have a chicken in every pot and a Chevy in every, every garage. You may not live in the square footage your mom and dad did, but I promise you this, you're not a mistake and God's still got a plan. In fact, I submit to you, you're living in the most exciting time that any believer could ever live. And this is what he says to Joshua. Joshua, it's okay, buddy. Moses is dead. Now, that doesn't mean a cessation of life. In reality, Moses is more alive than he's ever been. And then I want you to notice what he does. He not only calls Joshua out of a moment of mourning, take off that wash off the ashes of mourning. Step into the, into, the, into, the, into the rejoicing of dancing. Joshua, this is not over. My servant is dead. And then I want you to notice something that the casual reader doesn't pick up on. It's not until God speaks in that moment, in that moment of agony, when everything seems lost, up until this point, to the best of my ability, scouring the word of God, I cannot find one place that God ever spoke directly to Joshua 
until Moses was dead. Do you know there's sometimes when God's got to remove something from you in order to do something in you? Now, I know you love your mom and dad, and, and they love you, but they want you to move out of their basement. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> they love you, and they want you, by the time you're 40, to get your own cell phone plan. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> Tough room. <coughs> so much has changed, and so much is shifting before us. And sometimes when we see the death of things around us and Change, uh, the fear of change is, 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 is not that it's changing, it's the fear of loss that we sense. Joshua's got to deal with this, you've got to deal with this. Your generation, um, it is characterized by a gripping, paralyzing anxiety. Your generation is the single greatest generation, single most generation ever to be medicated for paralyzing anxiety, worry, and um, um, uh, fear. I, I, we got more than we've ever had, but we have less peace than we've ever known. Because what we focused on sometimes is what we possess and we can hold in our hands instead of what God's doing that can't be held in our hands. He wants them to understand. He wants Joshua to understand. My plan's not dead. My man may be with me in heaven, but I, my plan to liberate. And Joshua, I'm going to use you to bring them in and it's going to be a major paradigm shift. Listen carefully before I move to the second point. Your generation is going to have to be more fluid than any other generation I suspect in the history of this nation. You're going to have to walk by faith in ways that the previous generations have not had to. What God wants to do with you is not going to be defined by buildings and parking lots. It's not going to be defined by steeples and stained glass. What God wants to do to your generation cannot be contained inside of a denominational movement. What he wants to do in you, just like he's going to say to Joshua, Joshua, stop crying. There is a season to mourn. There is a time to weep, but this is not it. I need you to rise up. And the moment that Joshua responded, God spoke to him directly with revelation. There's going to be times when you're going to say, I, I, I don't know if I can do it on my own. I don't know if I can step out like this. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I assure you, before you get where you're going, God's already met you there. Amen. Now, here's the second point that I want you to get a hold of very quickly. Not only step number one, that, that you, you, it's not an ending, it's a beginning. Here's step number two. God's preparing you for what he has prepared for you. I'm going to reiterate it one more time. Verse 1, and after the death of Moses, it came to pass. That means there was a period of time where he was allowed to mourn. He was allowed to simply sit and reminisce about what a blessing it was to have a mentor like Moses, to have a man of God that was so powerful and mighty like Moses. And then the Lord spoke to Joshua. Now, there's three truths I want you to get a hold of, graduates, very specifically out of this. Sometimes God has to move us out before he can move us in. Sometimes he's got to do what he's doing with Joshua. Joshua's been very comfortable as an associate. He's been very comfortable being the servant. He knew exactly how to, to minister to and to be there for Moses. But the truth of the matter is Moses is gone and now it's time for him to step up and begin to experience some deep re revelation and truth that he has not previously. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this in love, but I want you to hear me. It's time for some of you to grow up. You can't be spoon-fed anymore. It's not about youth camp anymore. It's not about a retreat. It's not about you coming in here and everything being prepared for you. You are now a leader. You are now responsible. You are now, Moses is dead. It's time to move into a new dimension. And it's time for you to understand that God has a divine plan for you. And sometimes, sometimes, God's got to move you out before he can move you in. Yeah. Number two, sometimes God has to remove some things from us before he can do some things in us. Now, again, it's not, it's not obvious to the casual reader of the Bible, but if you get to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 11, uh, it seems to be just an ancillary thought. It seems to be just something that, that really, I mean, why would you even put it in there? He says in verse 11 to Joshua, command the people to prepare their own meals. Now, if you are not a student of the Bible, you may find this... Um, Rather incredulous, this may be something that's hard for you to fathom, but for the last 39 and a half years, since the Hebrews have left Egypt, every morning, 
in the morning and the evening, in the uh, morning and the noon and evening, six days a week, this miracle thing called manna. Now, we really don't necessarily know what it was. We just understand that it was a, some type of sustaining, nutritional bread of some supernatural source. They would get up six days a week. Now, they would gather enough on the sixth day in order to make it through the Sabbath so that they could just spend some time with the Father. But can you imagine for the last 39 plus years, they, 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 they Ubered it. Some of you... are going to have to learn how to use a microwave. <laughs> Some of you are about to have a rude awakening. You're going to find out the reason that we had seven coronaries when you left that milk on the counter is because that cost more than a cow. <laughs> that box of cereal you never seem to wrap back up and is stale by tomorrow morning, it cost $14, and that's why we wanted to kill you before you left the house. <laughs> Joshua is a paradigm. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's got to say to these people, um, God is removing something from you in order to teach you that he wants to do something through you. If you want to eat, you're going to have to get up in the morning and you're going to have to go get it yourself. There was a rock that we know, both in the Old Testament revelation and the New Testament confirmation, there was a rock that followed this six plus million people around all across the desert, dry parts land, and it gave forth incredible water. In fact, Paul says that that rock rolled behind them every time they moved their camp. That rock would roll, and when it stopped, it would spring forth water. It was a picture of the water that we drink, that we never thirst again from Christ. He simply said this, not only is there not going to be manna in the morning, but you're going to have to get your own water from now on. Now, I want you to hear this pastor's heart, and I mean, this with, I mean this with sincerity. But part of the problem in the American church is we've spoiled people rotten. We've spoiled them rotten. And we come into a building that, that's clean and prepared. We, we come in, and everything's laid out, and we, we, we put it in such a way that, that you, sometimes you don't even have to work for it. We are coming fast to a time. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but you need to understand something as, a, as this generation coming up. There is a bill in the house that we've asked. I've actually contacted our representative and I've asked for a copy of it because I'm alarmed by what I'm hearing. There is a piece of legislation in our national capital that, is a, that supposedly I've read the cursory of it, but I, I, I want to see it before I fully buy into what I'm being told by some leaders that I really respect and trust. That in the light of all that is going on in our nation with the Marxism and the Hamas and the calling for the extermination and the removal of the Jewish people, I am told that our uh, representatives are preparing a bill and it's already been written that the, old, that the New Testament parts of it become illegal or unacceptable in this, in this country because it's anti-Semitic. I hope I'm wrong. I pray to God I'm wrong. I've read the initial bill. I have asked for a physical copy. But I will say this. What I have read is alarming. Because what it's calling for is an overreaction because the New Testament qualifies the fact that it was of a Jewish vein that brought Christ up to Calvary. But it was the Romans' legislative process that actually crucified. Let me just clear something up for you. The Jews didn't crucify Jesus. The Romans didn't crucify Jesus. According to Isaiah 53, God killed his own son for me and for you. He drew back his omnipotent hand. And on that day when midday became absolute midnight and he became what you and I are, which is vile, wicked sinners, the Bible says he drew back his hand and he struck his son. He did not die. He did not die from crucifixion. He died because the father said, sin cannot be in my presence. And he killed his own son so that you and I might become sons and daughters of the most high God. You are living in an incredible time. It's time for us to, to rise up. It's not an ending. It's a beginning. 
Are, are we on the precipice of a major paradigm, political, cultural, economic shift? Yes, we are. Are things far different than they were even five years ago? Yes, they are. Do they bode that they could potentially become worse? Yes, they do. But you hear me. There is a God in heaven who sets high and looks low, and he has not slumbered nor slept. He has no Alzheimer's nor dementia. He is fully aware of what's going on, and he did not make a mistake when he crafted you in the womb of your mother. He did not look down and say, well, I shouldn't have made them 20-something years ago. You are a unique, wonderful design by God. And you, you will do things in your 20s and 30s that 60 and 70 year old preachers who are seminary trained could not begin to believe God doing. Because this is the truth. It's not an ending. It's a beginning. And God's up to something. And sometimes he's got to remove some things from you in order to do some things through you. Uh, thirdly, under that particular point, um, Sometimes God has to remind us to remind ourselves of who we are. Now, you can imagine the overwhelming sense of, of, of inferiority. You can imagine when God said to, to, to um, Joshua, now, Joshua, Moses is dead. You know that. You've been mourning his death, and you've been wondering. I've been, I know the heart. I know the intent. I know your thoughts. I know what you're wondering. How in the world are we going to get these people across this Jordan and the promised land? What are we going to do? And he's probably looking around going, I wonder, what, I wonder who would be the new Moses. And the Holy Spirit said, you. You're the new Moses. In that moment, it had to be paralyzing. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this preacher. If God were to show us just for a moment if he were to pull back the veil of our humanity, our frailty, our, our limited finite capacity, if he just showed us what he was willing to do through you, through me, it'd scare us to death. See, most of us have just enough religion to, to be miserable. We got just enough out of hell, but not enough of the hope of heaven to really understand that what he did on that day at Calvary was not simply forgive you of your sins, but in that moment, not only did he die at Calvary, but three days later when he got up with all power and glory, he sealed you by the Holy Spirit and the same spirit that rolled that stone away and picked him up from death and told death, hell, and the grave to go back to hell. It's the same spirit that lives inside of you. So you're not just educated. Dear God, don't give us any more preachers educated beyond their intelligence. I got a nice letter. <laughs> I will say this. They signed it. They're not from here. That's a shocker. He had three charges against me that he levied. He said, number one, I cannot believe that you tell those people in that church that there is a rapture. Well, it's in the Bible. And I don't edit it. I just preach it. We are not kept for an hour of wrath and all throughout the word of God multiple times Harpazo is mentioned over and over again and because I settled out of court I am not staying for the rest of this mess. There is a moment coming when I'm getting up and I'm going out of here as part of the bride of Jesus Christ. It's in the book. I can't preach anything else. Secondly, he was upset with me because I'm constantly reminding you that the Father still speaks. And he said to me with great anger in large capital letters, quit telling those people God still speaks. God doesn't have anything else to say. <laughs> well, I say with all love and respect, I talked to him this morning. He had a lot to say, a lot. And every time I opened this book, I discovered that not just mere words on Black words on, on white paper, I discovered that the supernatural capacity is that God can say something that this book cannot contain. It doesn't ever contradict it, but I'm telling you, it's amazing to me how many times I've read the same verse a thousand times and I see depth that I've never seen before because my father longs to speak Amen. to his children. Amen. And he said, lastly, and I will be responding Quit telling them that God still does miracles. Well, if we had a moment and we could take the camera, I would show you a room full of miracles. And lest you misunderstand me, I'm not just talking about 
those who've been cured from cancer and illness. I'm not just talking about Johnny Sawyers who walked out free from leukemia. I'm not just talking about a bride who was, I was told she'd be gone in six months to a year. I'm not just talking about those who have watched uh, the, the miracle of modern medicine remove a malady. I'm talking about there's miracles all over this room. They were on their way to hell, sin bound. They were ensnared and the penalty of sin was death. And all over this room are those who couldn't work their way, tithe their way, teach their way. They couldn't attend their way. All over this room are sons and daughters of the Most High God who in a moment of conviction stepped into the glory of God and whispered the name that's above all other names and stepped from death to life. I call that a miracle. That's a miracle. So, 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 so sometimes, sometimes, sometimes in, in, in what God's going to call you to do, he didn't call you to the university primarily to get another degree or an education. He called you there as a missionary. He didn't call you to that class to pursue some particular vocation. He called you to walk on that campus because there's a whole generation that have been seduced and they're being lied to and they're being told that God is dead and the Bible is antiquated and that we need to embrace some humanistic Marxism and confused about who we are and how God made us. I'm telling you the whole point and purpose that you're where you're going and doing what you're doing and it's overwhelming and sometimes you'd like to sit down with Joshua and say with Joshua, God, I can't do this. You're going to have to get a Moses. And God said, you are Moses. You are Moses. And he says very specifically to him in, 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 in verse 8, this is what he says. Now, this, I said it this way in my private praise and prayer time. Sometimes God has to remind me to remind myself of who I am. Now, listen to it in light of that statement. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night and observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, let me tell you, they're telling you because you live in the 21st century, and we are now coming into the age of artificial intelligence. Listen to me. I'm not worried about artificial intelligence. I'm worried about natural stupidity. That scares me more than that artificial intelligence. And you're going to be told that somehow or another the human race is now antiquated. It's outdated. Somehow or another that by the time you hit your 30s or 40s, that AI is going to be able to systematically do things that, that, that the human mind, and it is, it is, it is an amazing. I've seen it. I've, 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 I've sat in some conferences with it. It is an, I don't believe that it's technology. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, just in case you hadn't figured out I'm a little kooky. I don't believe that it's technology. I believe it's supernaturally demonically charged. I don't think it has anything to do with a SIM card or with bits or bytes or with binary language. I believe that it is supernaturally charged because what it is doing is not within the human realm. But you listen to me. You are a child of the Most High God. And no weapon formed against you will prosper. And the problem, the problem you're going to face is, is not the fear that grips you. It's the faith that will release you. I'm telling you, the mountain will move. The demon will flee. God can do what you cannot begin to think, hope, or imagine if you simply remind yourself. You are seated in the heavenlies, robed in righteousness, crowned in glory. You are a child of the most high God. And if they look at you and tell you, and there's a time coming if Jesus tarries, when they're going to say to you, uh, what, what, what's your AI augmentation? Did you have an eye replaced so that, so that you, you, could, you could compute so that when somebody walks up on you, you just immediately have a facial recognition and a bio that, that, that spits out in your mind? Listen, Lynn, listen to me. You are not a computer. You're a child of God. You are not a mere machine for the production of, of producing taxes and paying bills. You were sought out by a living, holy God. And there's going to be times when you're going to have to set yourself down and say, you know what, self, here's the truth of the matter. I know Professor Smellyfoot has told me that I came from a single cell amoeba floating on some primordial ocean. And my great-great-grandfather was a baboon sucking on a banana in a banyan tree. But I know this. He wove me together in the womb of my mother. And I am a child of the Most High God. There's going to be times when it's overwhelming and you're going to have to sit down and just like Joshua, you're going to have to say, I got to remind myself of who God said I am. Do y'all know I'm, I am six foot 11 in my spirit. Do y'all know that? <laughs> say amen. amen. <laughs> Here's your third step. We're almost done. Some of you already are. <laughs> Feed your faith. Starve your doubts. 
feed your faith, starve your doubts. Now, how do you do that? Three ways very quickly. First, who you choose to run with will determine how you finish your race. Who you choose to run with will determine how you finish your race. Let me explain to you. When I was praying over that lovely letter that that individual sent me, um, there was a praise that the Holy Spirit put in my mind and my heart. And I, didn't, I, I had to unpack it a little bit. I, I didn't understand necessarily immediately what, what God was ministering to me. I wrote it down, and, and, and this is what the Lord said to me. He, he, because I, I wanted to respond. I, I know this will disappoint you, but I wanted to respond in a, in a manner that would not have honored God. And the Lord said, put that aside. I'm not, I'm, we're not answering him. We're going to talk about you. And in that process, the Holy Spirit said to me, Jeff, he doesn't, he doesn't believe the Bible differently than you. He just doesn't believe all of the Bible you do. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't make us better than anybody else. That doesn't, make, that doesn't put me above any. What it means is simply this. There's not one accident. There's not one syllable. There's not one sentence. There's not one comma. There's not one colon. There is nothing in that book that you hold that God accidentally, incidentally put in there that is not for your edification and equipping in these last days. And who you run with is going to determine how you finish your race. So I'm telling you, you know, we used to say it in, back in the day. We used to say it this way to the students. We'd say it this way. We'd say, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Show me who you're running with. I'll show you where you're going to end up. That's basically what we're saying. And you're going to have to make some hard decisions. You're going to have to decide if, uh, those that, 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 that hinder you, those that halt your faith, those that are constantly berating you. You're going to have to make a hard decision. That's what Joshua's about to do. He's about to say to some folks who he loves desperately, we're going across this Jordan and we're going to step out by faith. Now, can you imagine? Man, that river is rampant. It is running. It's ripping trees up. It's out of its banks. And, and he's, not, he's not Moses. <laughs> I wish I could preach there for a minute. Yeah. But my first five years here, I'm telling you, if one more person said to me, that ain't how we used to do it. <laughs> well, I didn't come here to do it how you used to do it. <laughs> I came here to do it like he said, do it. <laughs> Amen. I can't help what you did five years before I got here. That five years ain't here. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you something. They outlaw the New Testament. And, they, they, and don't think for a skinny minute that they won't try. And they say, you can't assemble like this anymore. You're a threat. You're preaching things that are, that are against the, the flow of the cultural acceptance. Standing in universities and screaming from the river to the sea. Most of them morons couldn't find Gaza on a, on a map. If you stuck a, a pin in it, you, they couldn't find it. A friend of mine from Texas, they started that mess out in Texas and they've gone to a, uh, they're, 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 they've gone to a, uh, they're not going to eat. They're not going to eat until the university gives them all that they want. <laughs> so you know what these guys in Texas did to frat boys? They got them a big old grill and a sack of ribs the size of a brontosaurus and fired that sucker up and blew the smoke right over in there to them. <laughs> Who you choose to run with will determine why you finish this race. Secondly, and almost finally, don't, don't judge people according to their past. Popular opinion or their current trials and tribulations. I need you to listen closely as I hasten to a close. I'm, I'm going to do this, paraphrase this for the sake of time. Joshua has figured out, you know, I want you to notice he didn't send 12 out this time, he sent out two. He'd already tried that committee stuff. And that committee came back, the 12 of them, 10 of them said, uh, we vote that we can't do it. There's the Raphadim, there's Nephilim, there's flesh-eating, demonic DNA dudes over there. We can't handle them. And they prevailed upon the people and sowed fears in their, fear in their heart. And Joshua, who has now risen to the occasion, he didn't pick 12, he picked two. And I don't know this, but when we get to heaven, we'll, we'll interview Joshua. We'll ask him. 
Why'd you pick those two? And I suspect that the same life that Moses was pouring into Joshua, Joshua was pouring into these two boys. And when it came time, oh, Joshua said, hey, you two come here. <laughs> you radical pew jumping, hanky waving, snot slinging, soul winning, tithing. I need y'all to do something. I want you to go into the land. Now, you're not going to figure out whether or not we can take it. He's already given it. I want you to go ahead because militarily, we got to strategize how we're going to do it. So these two old boys, they, they take off, and the, and the sun begins to set, and it's, it, it, they're over in, the, in enemy territory. Now, in my sanctified imagination, I can't help but believe these are two deacons. And they ease up on the edge of town. And, and they say, listen, we can't, we can't stay out here. We'll get killed. And one of them says, well, there's a house right there. And the other one says, well, that's a brothel. Okay, let me try it on this side. <laughs> we can't go in there. That's a house of ill repute. That's Rahab's house. And the other one says, oh, come on. Now, that's none of our deacons. I just want you to know that. <laughs> now, here's what could have happened. When they knocked on that door, Rahab, the Bible says, took them up on the roof. And this is my personal conviction. You don't have to buy this. She took them up to the roof and she covered them. Now, the word in the Hebrew is, is voluminous. It, it's mega. If you translate it, it's, it's multiple. It's stacks of flax. Now, if you go to Proverbs 31 and verse 13, flax... Is a, is a precious commodity. In fact, it's worth more than silver and gold in Rahab's particular time. I don't think she's, she's prostituting herself. I think she shut the brothel down, and I'm going to show you why I believe that in just a minute. And now she's producing a very, a very fine linen that brings in a tremendous uh, economic boom. She has, she has no longer selling herself. She's working with her hands, and she hides them under all of these flax stacks. And while she's doing it, now if they'd have judged her, well, I must tell you, I'm a Baptist deacon. I cannot be seen with a brothel owner. And if you are a deacon, I wish you wouldn't. <laughs> Here's my point. Boy, it's hot in this room today, isn't it? Here's my point. We're living in a post-Christian nation. We, we, there was a time when I started in the ministry, I could simply illustrate a text like this from other places in the Bible. I can't do that anymore because we suffer from a massive illiteracy of the Bible. And I'm not talking about lost people, I'm talking about a church. Yeah. I mean, if I just threw a reference out there and didn't tell you where it came from, the, the vast majority of believers, according to every survey that we've got, is that they don't read the Bible and they have no ability, no, no capacity to put that together. So we have to illustrate in a different way. We are biblically illiterate in this nation today. And because of that, we can't take up the sword and war, which is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, I just proved my point. <laughs> if you judge people based on public opinion, if you look at their current situation instead of God's potential, well, preacher, I tell you, you're not from here. and You don't know that family. They, I just tell you, I, I don't know if I'd let them in the church. I'm going to tell you that's the very ones Jesus died for. Amen. And if you judge somebody based on where they are instead of where the gospel can take them, you're going to miss some miracles of God. And I suspect them old boys walked in that house and said, boy, I'm going to tell you, if Pastor Joshua finds out that we're in a brothel, we're going to get churched. And by the time they got up to the roof, she said, boys, I ain't in the brothel business anymore. In fact, let me tell you, and, and I'm going to read it, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to tell you right now, when you get home and this hits you, you it's going to make you shout. Because here's the last one. That, that you're, you're, you got to feed your faith, starve your doubt. Don't leave any room for what God has commanded you to do to be removed by the enemy. Now, here's what I mean by that. Jo uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Now, before they lay down, they're up on, on Rahab's roof. She came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us and all that the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea 
for you when you came out of Egypt and when uh, and what you did with the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Shahan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard of these things, our hearts melted within us. Now, you, 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 I want you to just put in the margin of your Bible, that was 40 years ago. Now, would you listen to this? Listen to me. Too many believers are living in the doubt and the death of a desert when the enemy has more faith in God than the children of God. Wait, wait a minute. You mean to tell me we've been over there strategizing and dying for 39 and a half years worried about how we're going to take the land? And you bunch of pagans who don't know the Lord, you've never been delivered. You weren't, you weren't rescued out of Egypt. You don't have the promise of Abraham. You don't know what it is to be a child of the king. You mean to tell me y'all been trembling in your boots? Yes, because we saw what he did. And we've got more faith as pagans than you do as children of God. Can you imagine the indictment? in their spirits at that moment. Listen to me, I'm begging you in Jesus' name. There is a moment coming. Some of you are not going to make it. You're just not going to do it. You walked an aisle, you signed a card, you prayed a prayer, but here's the truth of the matter. You, you, the, The prayer you prayed didn't change the life you live, and I'm telling you on the authority of God's Word, not as a Baptist, but as a Bible preacher, I'm telling you on the authority of God's Word. You walked that aisle, you prayed that prayer, but I'm telling you that prayer didn't change the life you live. It's not going to change where you're going. You've been woefully deceived. You got wet in water, but you've never been washed in the blood. You got just enough religion to redeem yourself, but not be redeemed by the power of the Lamb. And there's a moment coming when you least expect it. And you're going to run to this church and say, where's that preacher? Preacher ain't going to be here anymore. Most of this room ain't going to be here anymore. We're going to drop this bag of flesh. We're going we're gonna to split the skies at the speed of light. We're going to the one who bought us. We're going to sit down at a marriage supper prepared for those who have received the king and the lamb of God. And we're going to come back seven years later and rule with the king. Amen. You got just enough religion to be deceived. But there's a second group. You did get saved. God did a work in your life. But you've been on a funeral march for years in a desert of drought and doubt and death. And you've never stepped into the fullness of all that he's got for you. There's a moment coming when you're going to stand before the one who gave everything he had to give you everything he's got. And he's going to ask you this question. What did you do with the life I gave that you might live forever? See, beloved, it's it's not an ending, it's a beginning. God's doing something in this generation. See, while we're watching over three dozen universities cry out for the extermination of the Hebrews, what the media won't tell you is that they baptized over a thousand Wednesday night at the UT campus right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And that thing went till 2 o'clock in the morning. What they will not tell you is that a revival has broken out in Liberty University up in Lynchburg, Virginia. And it's still going today. And by the thousands, people are driving from all over the Northeast just to get to Liberty. Not to go to college, but because there's a move of God. What they won't tell you is there's a second wave that has broken out at Asbury just north of us. And God is calling sons and daughters who are coming with a blessed hope. And God's calling to the missions and to ministry. And they are standing by faith to take this country back with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What they won't tell you is that some of these young men and women who stood up on this platform with a coffee cup, they've got their cup so full that it's pouring over and they may have a degree, but what they've got more than a degree is a hot heart for souls and a passion for Jesus. What they will not tell you is there's churches that are breaking out in revival across this land because the darker it gets, the brighter the gospel glows. You lift up your head, church. You don't let this world beat you down. Don't you sit down with Joshua and cry because Moses is dead. Moses is fine. He's with God. You're alive. Get up in Jesus' name. Get out here and go tell somebody what he's done for you. And if you don't have a testimony, I'd like to invite you this morning to get one. All you got to do is right where you're at, just simply say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Because of what you did at Calvary, because of the shed blood of the Lamb, I receive the gift of your death, life, and resurrection. And today, you can step across God's Jordan. Let's pray together.